Right. So why did she or he, your therapist, tell you that? Um, Because I was struggling a lot with... Hey, this is Kara. You're watching Really Famous, where you really get to know your favorite celebrities on an intimate level because I was a therapist, so that's how I like to do things. Right now, you are about to get to know Kelty Knight, who you already know from Entertainment Tonight and award shows. She's like usually on the red carpet interviewing people. And she also is part of the Lady Gang. They have a podcast, book, and a whole bunch of other things. But in this talk, she really opens up about some things that you probably didn't know before. So you'll want to stick around to the end. Some of them come later. So how do you keep like your confidence going? To It seems to me like you're somebody who had confidence early on in life. Am I wrong? Um, well, confidence, ye sure. I think what I, my mom was actually on the Lady Gang podcast this week um, or in the next few weeks and we were interviewing our parents as a series and I think it's really funny. And I asked her, I was like, who do I think I am? Like, how were you, how did you control me? And she said, it wasn't that you were overly confident. It's that rejection didn't phase you. So for me, I, um, I, I, don't know why, but like water off a duck's back. When someone doesn't like my outfit, when someone doesn't like me, when someone doesn't like my face, when someone doesn't like what I say, I feel it for like a moment. And then it's just like, it's gone. It doesn't penetrate me. And so I think that's where my confidence comes from is that when I walk on the red carpet, I like my outfit. I don't need you to like it. Um, when I do my podcast or when I'm on television, like, yes, you can tweet me, uh, that you think I'm ugly and my voice is annoying, but like, I don't feel that way about myself. So it doesn't really judge me. Okay. That is a gift. I know. I know no one has it. I'm so insecure in other ways. So it's not that I think I'm like the greatest thing. It's just that I, I'm for some reason it doesn't phase me. I don't know. Okay. So what are those ways that you're insecure? Hey, we got to the question that we both like to get to. No, there we go. Yay. You got me. <laughs> um, I'm very competitive uh, with myself and with others. And um, it's very difficult for me to uh, not have everything. So if there are 10 jobs available and I have the bandwidth to do two, I want 10. You know, if there are, um, I want everything offered to me. My husband says, you just want to be number one on every person's list. So it's like, I know that's not possible, but I want to be picked every time. I want every boy to love me. I want every one person want to be my best friend. And I want every job to be like, you know, we need her. She's unbelievable. And that's just not ever going to happen in life. And so that is hard for me. Um, I'm also a recovering workaholic. And so I'm a three on the Enneagram. I don't know if you do Enneagram. Do you know it from like, yeah, um, like vaguely. Okay. So three is like, we're, we're called the achiever. And so essentially the Enneagram is like all about, and this is, there's probably a different word for it um, in therapy, but it's all about the thing you do to avoid doing the work on yourself. And so with a three on the Enneagram, you are an achiever. So instead of dealing with my own toxic traits and my own insides, I just achieve. I outwardly win awards and put out that I'm doing great things and, you know, show off my fabulous life. Uh, and I really don't take stock in caring about the things that are not achievements, the everyday, the cooking a dinner, enjoying time with friends, having a relationship with my parents, going for a walk, nature, all of those things are very meaningless to me unless I really focus on it. That's interesting. So I guess when you hear news of somebody doing something that you could have done, is it like, do you kind of like be like, ah, I kind of, I wish I was doing that or I could have been the one doing this. Every time. And it happens all the time. Like there's red carpet pre-shows happening right now. And I'm like calling my gym. I'm like, why didn't you have me in on this? He's like, you don't want to do that. And I was like, he's like, that's, that's not for you. And I was like, oh yeah, you're right. I mean, it's not for me, but I still want them to offer it to me. Um, And so that, you know, gets me in trouble. And then this year, you know, to be honest, I've been up for uh, a couple of really big jobs and lost all of them. And so um, when you're up and you're in that last handful for like a big promotion, it's, it's hard to not get it for sure. Definitely. Um, But again, the rejection for me is very quick. And I think I like, I allow myself to be sad for 24 hours and like eat French fries in the bathtub and a McFlurry. And then I get on with it and start doing the next thing. So you don't judge yourself from it. 
like if, if you don't get the job, let's say you're disappointed, you feel bad, you feel frustrated, but you don't feel bad about yourself necessarily or question yourself or your abilities or do you? I think that I'm pretty confident in my abilities. Um, I know I'm a great host. I know I'm great at live television. Um, I'm not as famous, as notable as maybe like clickbaity. I don't have a famous boyfriend. I don't have a famous husband. I don't, um, I didn't come off a reality show. And a lot of times those are the reasons why I'm losing a job. Like, you know, it's like, oh, this person is of the now. So they, everyone wants that like fresh new thing. And I'm just like that chick that's been on TV for 10 years, you know? And so, um, I don't, I guess, internalize that because there's really very little I can do with that. I love my husband so much. He's very private. He's a businessman and I'm not going to like break up with him to go, you know, do a PR relationship to get kind of in front and center. Although like, you know, if he ever divorces me, I probably will marry someone famous next. (laughs) It would help my career a lot. Yeah. 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 But that's, again, that's one of those things that if you did internalize it, or if you did let it get you down for too long, not only do you have no control over it, but that's like the nature of the beast, right? And you don't necessarily want to buy into that because then you've really given over, you've given over your life to something that is probably not with your, you know, in your belief system, which you wouldn't want. Yeah. I agree with you. And, yeah. and, and for me, I'm all about creative. And I think that's actually where like the Lady Gang podcast came from is that, you know, over time, if you're stepped over time and time again in your, in your job, you know, for whatever that promote, and I think everyone can relate to this, that promotion, the next thing, and you see people being promoted around you and you're like, wait, I can, I, I remember sitting with Becca Tobin, we were having lunch and she had just come off Glee and was having a hard time getting another acting job because there was this whole thing of like glee is done and we don't want any of the glee kids like they've had their time you know so we were both kind of in this place and we said we just want to create something we can't get fired from we want to create something where we can choose ourselves and so that's where i think my drive to create my own place at the table my own space in the entertainment business has been so huge because no matter what happens at the auditions no matter what happens in tv land um I can always come back to that thing I've created and it's very successful. And it's like, I know that if I work really hard at it and pick myself and invest in myself, then good things will happen. And that's been very, yeah, it's been very, very inspiring. I wonder if that's so interesting. I wonder if that's the reason why more people in entertainment have started podcasts. And I never really thought about this before, but it seems like every day there's somebody else with a new podcast and the names are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, Bruce Springsteen and Barack Obama just Crazy. like launched a podcast. So like, and right before them, it was like oh, Michelle Obama or whatever. So it's like the biggest, biggest. But I wonder if some of it may be, and I'm not really talking about them specifically because they have a little right. more control over their lives, right. I think. But people who are in entertainment, it's like you have to give up a lot of the, or not even give up. You just don't have a lot of the control. So I wonder if maybe that is why, another reason why a lot of celebrities have started podcasts. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's really interesting. I think that we'll see them all come and then we'll see them go because as you know, podcasting and putting out weekly shows, yeah, Lady Gang comes out twice a week, um, yeah. is a lot more work than you think. And I think everyone's like, oh, we can make some money here. Okay, I'll start it. I'll try it. It's a lot more work. Um, but I think it's easy, relatively easy when you're in your downtime from doing a movie or music or whatever, like you can do something fun. And I think that in traditional press, sometimes these stars are misunderstood. And so they really you know, do have souls and care and want to have a place where they can just be themselves. Like Dak Shepard is a great example. He's always been wonderful, always great, a fabulous actor, very funny guy, but like he's really coming to his own as a podcast host. And like, you just love him for being that inquisitive man that he is flaws and all, you know, whereas his issues with alcohol and addiction, he was always trying to hide those from the press because it was like this story you didn't want people to know. And now he's doing the podcast where he's so open about it and he's being celebrated for that. So isn't that a wonderful thing? Well, that's what we were talking about before too. When you decided to be more honest about, well, let's show the behind the scenes or whatever. It's the same thing. The more that you can display yourself and the, your reality, people respond to that. So yeah, that's true. Yeah. And even as podcast guests too. I mean, I think that people appreciate seeing that real person instead of flaws and all. The flaws are what makes everybody human. And it what's, it's what makes everybody beautiful. 
So yes, podcasting all the way. But yeah, it is a lot more work than people think. Sometimes 100%. I tell people, if I had known how much work it would be, I would not have done it. And I'm glad that I didn't know because I'm so, I love having this podcast. And it's more than a podcast. You know, we have videos too and streaming all over the place, but it really is. Thank God I did it. I love it. And it has like been wonderful for so many people, but it definitely takes more work. Like how many hours a week do you think you spend on it? Or do you do it in batches? Um, I mean, we're all over the place with Lady Gang. Now we have such a big business, right? We have the podcast, we have the podcast network, we have clothing, we have books, we have touring. So there's just a lot. We have employees. So, um, I would say I am working on Lady Gang from eight till five, eight till six every day, uh, and taking breaks throughout the day to do things like come on your show or go on other shows or take calls or meetings. But we're, um, you know, very interested in launching like a charity initiative this year. So we've been taking meetings with all these different partners for that. And we're always moving the, you know, if I just wanted to do the podcast, that would be one thing, but as a brand, like we're always moving forward. So, uh, yeah, it's a full-time job at this point. So, but that helps you too, because you have interest in doing the 10 jobs, like you were saying, if you have the bandwidth for two, you can do that. You want to do the 10. And -hmm. this is kind of as close as you can get to doing the 10. When we wrote our book this year, um, it was called Act Like a Lady. And we got the book deal, I guess, last uh, two years ago. And it was not a huge book deal. Like they were just kind of like, oh, these like podcast girls, let's write a book. And we loved writing the book. So we write the book and then it became a New York Times bestseller. I, in this kitchen, like where I am right here in my house, bawled. I mean, I was on my knees crying. I would have never been offered the opportunity to write a book, to be on Good Morning America, to, you know, become a New York Times bestselling author for just being me. It was like, you have to like create this thing and having all of those 10 jobs is what diversified my world. Like if I was, had been just happy being on entertainment tonight, I would have never had the opportunity to do all this other stuff. So I just like, to me, having those seven jobs or having 10 jobs is, is like the, the magical number. Steve Harvey once said in an interview, you got to have seven jobs so that when you lose two, you don't care. And I have always followed that advice. So diversifying I love myself that as a woman has been so powerful because when things haven't gone my way, I'm never like, what am I going to do with my life? My whole life is ruined. And all of me is wrapped up in this other person's opinion. I'm like, okay, cool. You don't want me. Well, these people over here do. So I'm going to change lanes. Yeah, that is, I can relate to that. I totally get that. So are you said something before too that I forgot to ask you about. Did I read that you were on The Bachelor? Yes. Yes. So you were on The Bachelor. It is an iconic, an iconic moment that will follow me the rest of my life. For some, this is the power of Bachelor Nation. Every single person I meet wants to talk about this. And I literally have talked about it more in my life than time I actually spent on The Bachelor. Like (laughs) I was, so I had retired. I was a professional dancer as a rockette. And you were in, wait, you were a rockette. In New York. And then you were also in New York. And then you also were a cheerleader for the Nets and the Knicks. Is that right? Yeah. So um, basketball has dance teams. They don't have cheerleaders, but it's similar. It's costumes, it's sparkles, it's high kicks. I get it. Okay. Um, So I was on the Knicks dance team and the Nets dance team in my twenties growing up in New York as like a part-time job and then got the Rockettes and toured around with them and did that show. And then I got really burnt out from the dance career and I decided to come out to Los Angeles for like six weeks to stay with my friend Christina and just like try out the dance scene in LA. And I came and I was single. I was on match.com. I met this guy. I thought we were going to be in love. I thought he was my dude. And we went on two dates we talked forever. And then we went on two dates and he picked someone else. And then I was heartbroken. We're sitting at lunch, me and Christina. And she's like, you should just go on The Bachelor. Mind you, at this time, Christina and I both were so poor. We did not have televisions. We had never watched watched an episode of The Bachelor, but I loved pop culture. So I was always reading Us Weekly, like always. And so, you know, The Bachelor people were always these like love stories in Us Weekly. It's like amazing. So I was like, okay, great. So I signed up thinking like, this is so stupid. And just like another audition, I went to the meeting. They were like, oh, great. Do you want to go on? And I was like, okay. I just wish I had prepared the way that I prepare for my Grammy interviews for The Bachelor because I think I could have been so good. But if you don't watch it, you don't know how it works. So I was just like, okay, hey, and like kind of being loud and, and like hiding. And then, you know, anyway, so I made it one night and then I got kicked off. Oh, okay. So is it, I mean, you probably have to ask this too. I don't watch it, but I've seen it and I know that everybody watches it. So is it real? Well, I mean, it's real TV. Like I really went, I, 
I was in a limo with Emily Maynard and Michelle Money. I wore a cute dress. I did a high bat ma out of the limo. I met Brad Womack. He was wearing a lot of makeup in that moment. I was like, I don't even like this guy. Uh, and he's not my, my type because I love a skinny rock and roll boy. And we went in. So I went into the house. I mean, that was all real. I talked to him for about a total of 3.5 minutes and then the rose ceremony, I went home. So like, you didn't like me either. So that, I guess that was as real as it is. I do think that people form these real relationships, um, whether or not they work out in the long term is another thing. But I know a lot of people who met in real life that their relationships don't work out. So sure. That's true too. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about real relationships. So you said your husband is uh, a businessman, so he's private. Yes. Chris Knight is very, very private, private Instagram. Um, He hates to be in a photo. Um, He is in the music business. So he's a general manager and and a manager of of clients Um, and and very high, high uh, caliber clients. So I can understand why his privacy, who says, you know, I want to manage stars. I don't want to be a star. And he's just one of those people. I don't understand it at my core. He doesn't want to share any of his life with anyone. Like when he gets a new car, when he works out or he goes on vacation, like he never posts a photo. No one knows where he is. He has no social media. Um, like once a year, I'm like, could you please put something for your 200 followers that are mostly our friends and family about me on my birthday? Like, could you post something? And like every third year he will, like, he's just not of the world in that way. That's, I love that. I think it's great. It's the opposite of you maybe in a certain way, but yours is great too. I think it's both great. But does it sometimes, is it sometimes a little bit like, okay, I need you to take a picture of me or a video of me or whatever. How does he feel about those, that side of it? You know, well, Chris Knight is the best husband on the planet. And so he'll truly, if I ask him, he'll truly do anything that I want. You know, there's oftentimes we're at the Grammys and that our worlds are colliding and the photographers on the red carpet would be like, Kelty, get your husband, take a picture. So there are like three red carpet photos of us out there, like on Getty Images um, for the world. And he's he's fine to like, he came on the podcast a couple of times. Cause I asked him like, if I ask him, but I know the ask, like I know to respect his boundaries as a human being, he doesn't want to be on my Instagram every day. He doesn't want to have every person knowing at what time he's arriving home and blah, blah, blah. And there's some people that, you know, profit off that and do that. And they're like, kind of become this public couple. And I'm okay to just be me with a secret Chris night. And yeah, I always yeah. say that, you know, I, I find it fascinating when couples in Hollywood can both be in the public eye or both be givers like that um, and how that dynamic must work because I love to be married and be in a relationship with what I call a normie. Like he's just a normal guy, you know? Yeah. I mean, I imagine also there are other problems that could come into play if you were both doing the same thing. There's probably some kind of competition often, not always. Every couple is different. Every couple has their own things. But I think probably you are avoiding certain things by being in two separate worlds like that. Yeah. And our worlds do cross often. And I will say like the times that I didn't know if our marriage was going to make it is always when our worlds cross, like a conflict of interest where I'm like, if you would just give me this exclusive interview, I would really get ahead in my career. And he's like, I don't want my person to do this interview. And I'm like, why? It's me. And they're like, because it's not a good look. And I'm like, but it's a good look for your wife. And we fight about it all the time. And he's very loyal to his clients. And that's can be difficult for me, you know? That is difficult. So there have been times where you felt like it wasn't going to work out? Of course. We've been together 10 years. I mean, there have been years. Um, there are times when in a relationship where you just love the person I look over and I'm just like googly eyes, even after all this time, I just adore him. And there's times a few years ago, um, his, his boss and partner passed away really suddenly at Christmas. And it was a shock to all of us. And it took him a good year to get back to being himself. You're just kind of like with your friends on hikes and, and going for walks. And you're like, I really don't know about this. And you know, you just stick it out. And I think anyone who says their relationship is as perfect as it looks on Valentine's day on Instagram is full of it. You know, and that's the truth. But again, here we go again with this image versus reality. It's like all those magazines you're talking about, like us weekly or whatever, even if they're not, um, taking advantage of somebody messing up, let's say they want to put somebody on the pedestal for being perfect. That is just as bad, really, right? They may have like, oh, the perfect marriage story, whatever, and it looks so polished and so glossy. It's just not relationships. It's not real. 
I think you'd be hard pressed to find a woman out there who couldn't list three things that went wrong on their wedding day, you know? And I think that that is a good look at like what love is like. Yeah, you get the perfect picture and you look amazing and your hair has never been shinier, but like, you know, there was this thing and this thing and this thing. And like, that's just the way it goes. And so I think that there is no one perfect and we get ourselves in a, a big hole when we try to be perfect or to live up to some version of perfection. It's an unfair pedestal that we've put our Hollywood celebrities on to be that way. Um, but I think that we're really, it feels like we're coming into this era of understanding that no one is perfect. My therapist, my personal therapist says, um, Kelty, you have to realize that you're not all good and you're not all bad. And I always think about that um, and say that to everyone. Every single person on this planet is not the best, not the worst, not all good all the time, not all bad all the time. Even the people that you look in the public and you're like, I hate that guy. He still probably has a kid who's like, I love my daddy. You know what I mean? Like everyone has a redeeming quality and a place where they are loved. And it's hard to understand that sometimes because we want everything to be so cut and dry. Right. So why did she or he, your therapist, tell you that? Um, because I was struggling a lot with how to be, I, I was struggling that I was getting this reputation for being kind of an asshole in business. Um, as the Lady Gang brand grew, we were involved in meetings and projects and things. And someone has to be, you know, the, the, adult in the room. And I was really hard because I wanted what was best for us. And I, I think I got this reputation of being a little difficult to work for. And so when I'd be in therapy or just a hard worker, overworking staff, you know, just like everyone's had that boss. Like I was that boss. Um, and I would be in therapy and I'd say, well, I'm just a dick. Well, you know, and, and, and I can't explain it. I'm just a dick. And she'd be like, well, are you though? Cause like some people really love you. Like, I don't think your husband would say you're a dick. And she's like, you know, you need to stop talking in these absolutes about yourself. Like I'm old, I'm ugly. I'm an asshole. I'm a dick. I'm a, whatever it is, you know? Um, so that was one of the things we really worked on, especially right, last six months. That's very interesting. So a lot of it is about self-narrative. What are you saying yeah. to yourself about who you are and what your life is? So yeah, and almost like I cast myself as the Disney, um, like, uh, evil person. You know, it was like, oh, well, I'm the hardworking, you know, nonstop contract, like, dick of the group who gets shit done, you know? Sorry. Um, and... Like I just then that was my narrative and that was who I was. And I just leaned so far into it that I was like, oh, well, if I'm going to be this jerk that I'm really going to go in and be like this difficult for everyone. And um, because it was just like, that's what everyone thought. So why try to change their minds? And um, I don't even know that people really thought that. But in my mind, I think anyway, it's a deep, how interesting brain is very deep. Yes, it is. And how interesting. Did she bring that to your attention that maybe they don't even think that that you might have created that yourself? Oh, yeah. I mean, the way that we speak to ourselves, I was just yeah. having this conversation last night. Um, what was my husband saying? No, it was a friend. Oh, my friend was saying, and you might probably know more about this. She was saying, um, I have a girlfriend that is uh, kicking cancer right now. And in the past few weeks, she's been speaking so positively. And it's like, you almost forget that she's fighting cancer because she's like, I'm good. Like, I, you know, like definitely turned a page. And I said, well, maybe this is kind of a good, she's like, I'm just going about my life. It's like, I kind of forget that I have cancer. And I said, well, maybe that's good for your brain because I don't know that your brain can distinguish between, you know, what's true and what you're just telling it. So if you tell your brain you're dying, it, your body will probably be, die. And if you tell your brain, like, I'm totally fine, the cancer's gone, maybe it'll tell your cancer to go away. Like, I don't know if scientifically that works, but it feels like it works for me. So I think that's a really interesting thing that if we, if you tell yourself you're old and ugly and terrible and unlovable, like, will you manifest into that? So interesting. Definitely. And I think there is absolutely a connection. And it's funny because when I was trained as a therapist, 
it, it wasn't so much that that was the way that it is. Like a lot of it is, yeah, well, some people have more issues than others or people do things or talk to themselves based on experiences they've had. So there's like a legitimate reason why they do. And you're just trying to bring it to light and help them go a different way. But I think the older that I get and the more that I read different things, the more I think there is that connection where you can manifest things one way or another. And I think there's so much more power in that than maybe I used to realize as a therapist when I was just strictly a therapist. So it is so interesting, but I do think that self-narrative, so important. So what? tell me one other thing, one other self-narrative that you had that you had to change at some point and successfully did or didn't. I mean, I'm still, I, I'm definitely working on them. I'm trying to think of like, um, I think for me, like we talked about before being an achiever, I think the narrative that I had to really work on was that I am worthless without my work. You know, that people are, people love me and people want to be around me because I am such and such person with such a such job. Um, and there probably are some people that want to be around me for that, but that's not the people who know me best, my best friends, my family, my husband, um, they don't, you know what I mean? They would rather me work less and like be able to go for walks and hang out and vacations and things. So, um, I think just that narrative that if, if I fail at my work life, that I am worthless. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's been definitely something that I've worked on a lot, a lot, a lot. Well, you can see, (laughs) you can see though, that your personality really comes through, let's say on Instagram or on the podcast and people respond to that. So again, it's your work, but you're not showing your work self or the job that you have and people are responding to that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I will say that, you know, I lived my whole thirties being like, if I'm just this version of a television host, then I'll have everything I ever wanted. And I've been, I get stopped. Obviously people, you know, you'll be at the drugstore, you'll be on an airplane and people look at you and they'll be like, I know that girl from somewhere. Did I go to high school with her? I don't know. Like, I feel like I know her. Whereas Lady Gang fans will stop me in the home goods because they saw my husband in another aisle and they know what he looked and he's so tall, he's six six. And they'll be like, I knew you were in the store. I came, I walked, looked around the Michael store because I knew you love crafts and you were here. And I'm your, your biggest fan. I know everything about you. Oh my God, are you picking out wallpaper for your house? Like there's such a dedicated fan base that it's like, oh, I thought that my salvation was going to come in this form and it's actually coming in a really different form. Um, And so life is surprising in that way. Let's wrap up with my favorite question, which has two parts. So the first one is, what is the image that people have of you? Who do they think Kelty Knight is? People who don't know you. I think they think I am conceited. Um, I think they think that I am a little pathetic. Um, And I think they think that I am extremely rich. And I think they think um, that I have been handed everything because I make it look very easy. Okay. So I'm curious, why, how do you know that that's what people think? Have you been told that or are you assuming it? Um, I think there's been different, different ways. Like, I think people think that I'm like, crazy rich because I was in my Facebook group this morning and there's like this table that I really want to buy at anthropology and it's the anthropology furniture is very expensive. And I was like, does anyone have a discount code? And they're like, you want a discount code? Who are you? I'm like, I'm still thrifty. Like I still want a, do, does anyone have a coupon? You know what I mean? So I'm not at like, you know, Oprah level where I'm like, I just get whatever I want. Like, that's not possible. I'm still a girl working. Um, I think that people think I, I, I got it all because I see a lot of like, you don't, she doesn't deserve this. Like you, you know, just the social media comments, I think is where I get like a lot of, you know, people, when you put yourself out in the public eye, there's many places people can leave a review of, of Kelty Knight iTunes, Spotify, the book review on Amazon, my Instagram page, the podcast page. I mean, there's a lot of public comments about my personality. So right. I actually have proof that people feel this way about me. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you read them to some degree and then you stop or like, how do you manage that? 
I think it's hilarious. I think it's, I think it's a good mix of being so funny that we actually sometimes read them on the podcast. Like, I think it's hilarious. And then it's also kind of good to keep yourself in check. You know, like I was like, oh, maybe people like, maybe I shouldn't ask people who've just lost their jobs during COVID, like about how to get this $1,500 table for cheaper. Like maybe that's triggering for people. Okay. Maybe I should keep that shit to myself, you know? And so I don't know, like there's, there's, I'll always like, if, if there's something useful in the feedback, I'll take it. But if it's right. just ridiculous, then I'll kind right. of like laugh about it. Well, I think that's interesting. It's a healthy mix of knowing what to get from it and what to say, no, thank you. This is not necessary. Cause there are yeah. people, I think it's common for people, even if they're not, if they don't mean anything, any harm by it. I do think that people tend to project things that they're experiencing onto people who they see out there. So it's going to happen. It's not necessarily a reflection of you. It's been a very, very difficult for year for so many people. And I, yeah. I do feel like people are angry to be angry. You know, there's many good reasons to be angry. And then sometimes they, people just don't have an outlet. Like, you know, if you've been stuck in your apartment or your house or sure. Zoom teaching your children for it, like you, we're all kind of at our wits end. And so I think there's just a little bit of like angry for the sake of just yeah. And you got to take that with a grain of salt. Sure. And that's like the outlet, right? Online. That's what everybody has. So who is the real Kelty Knight? Who are you for real? Um, I think if you ask like my very best friends who know me the best, they would tell you that I am, um, I'm very nerdy. Um, I love to be alone. I love to be in nature. I'm actually incredibly like outdoorsy, um, which a lot of times people wouldn't expect just because like I love a gown too. Um, I We actually just had an episode of Lady Gang. It was my birthday. And so we had a birthday episode and Jack and, and Becca were like talking about me. So I'm going to steal some of the things they said because I don't really know. But I think they were like, you know, you're so thoughtful. Like I'm always that person that you know, when someone's going through something, I'll always give up my whole day to help them. Um, and I think that I'm an incredibly hard worker. I think that I do in a way make it look kind of easy, but I, um, lose a lot of sleep and work really hard and, um, have sacrificed a lot of free time, health, family time, you know, all of that to get where I am. This is not the only part of this talk with Kelty. She reveals a lot more and we get into some fun, juicy details about her life. I put links to the other videos in the description below. Make sure you check it out. 